You faithful few who have braved the elements, thank you for being here. The word this morning comes to us from the book of Amos, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, and 21 through 24. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, when he, which he saw concerning, concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of jo Judah, and the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither, and the top of Carmel dries up. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Amos lived during the time of King Jeroboam II of Judah. Jeroboam was a mighty warrior and a skillful trader and raised Judah to new heights of wealth and power during his reign. But he was also arrogant and selfish. And the Bible tells us that Jeroboam did evil in the sight of the Lord. Today, we hear some of the words of Amos about the kingdom of Judah during this time. According to Amos, the king's triumphs had created in him an arrogant spirit of boastful overconfidence. And there was oppression and exploitation by the poor, of the poor by the mighty. Wealth and luxury in palaces of unheard of splendor and a craving for amusement. These were some of the fruits of these triumphs for the Jewish people. Sounds a bit uncomfortably familiar, doesn't it? Wikipedia says that Jeroboam's reign was during the period of the prophets Hosea, Joel, Amos, and Jonah, all of whom condemned the materialism and selfishness of the elites of their day. Woe unto those who lie upon beds of ivory, who eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp. The book of Kings condemns Jeroboam for doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, meaning both the oppression of the poor and his 
continuing support for the cult centers of Dan and Bethel in opposition to the worship at the temple at Jerusalem. So Amos is among those calling for both social and religious reform in Judah. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate, which is where disputes at that time were settled. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. There is the plea, followed by the warning, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. The people of Judah were fat, happy, complacent, and oppressed the poor. They had their wealth and luxury and could live the good life. All the poor and slaves worked in the fields so that they didn't have to. Reverend Trace Thayhorn writes, the times were hard. The government, a huge bureaucracy that provided so many important things like roads, military support, and the justice system was hopelessly out of touch with the people. And the religious establishment wasn't much better. It seems so focused on preserving the status quo that it had no vision for what might yet come to pass. When a prophet spoke out, they were vilified and punished, especially if they called into question the decisions of the government and religious leaders. Voices of hope arose, but just as quickly they fell as questions arose about the character of the speaker, or about transgressions in their past. Apathy was the prevailing attitude in the community, and it's not hard to imagine the people asking, why even bother when nothing seems to change? It's kind of hard to figure out the time period this refers to, isn't it? While this description refers to Israel in the time of the apostles, it could be referring to today in any town or city in America. The pervasive division and apathy of our age, the sense that nothing can improve and to bother to try to make things better is a fool's errand. And the despair that reigns in our hearts to a belief that poverty, hunger, and hopelessness have no real answers. Such matters are led to, left to Sisyphus, sadly rolling that stone up the hill, only to have it roll back generation after generation after generation. When I first started working on this text from Amos, I was having trouble finding the good news to bring this morning and asked a colleague for some advice. Her response was, preaching the, preaching the prophets is hard. Preach something from the New Testament instead. But that's part of the problem of today, isn't it? We like things easy. And we don't like to be troubled with the hard things. And sometimes, even though we're saved and forgiven, we still need to hear that prophetic voice that things are not as they should be or could be we can do better. I have another confession to make. 
I like listening to black preachers like Martin Luther King Jr. or William Barber. And in listening to them, I wonder why I can't preach passionately like they do. Well, maybe part of the answer is that they teach out of the Old Testament to an oppressed people who need the relief from the legacy of slavery, just as the people of Old Testament Israel did. Those who yearn for justice, identify with that prophetic call. The white church doesn't really need that because like the elites from Israel, we don't think we are in bondage, at least not nearly as much. So we prefer not to hear it. We have comfortable lives and essential workers to do the hard labor that we don't want to do. Our founding fathers fleeing religious persecution and oppression in Europe intended that the United States be a new Jerusalem for the world. Unfortunately, the U.S. of today more closely resembles the Jerusalem of Jeroboam's time than our forebearers saw. We aren't the beacon of religious hope and tolerance that they envisioned. It seems to me that all great nations and empires are fated to decline from greed and selfishness brought on by their wealth, arrogance, and complacency. It happened in Israel. It happened to Rome, Greece, and the British Empire. And it's happening here in the U.S. as we move into our post-truth and morality phase. Today, our elites are removing as many rights as possible from the middle class, poor, and minorities, such as voting and access to medical care. And they refuse to acknowledge the systematic racism that was key to this country's development, forces of which are still at work today. And they're trying to roll back our rights to universal health care by trying to get the Affordable Care Act and Social Security and Medicare because the elites don't need it and they don't want to pay taxes to support it. But most of the rest of us need it. The aging, the retired, the poor, we need and deserve the net of social programs that we earn by working and paying taxes all of our working lives. But the rich, they don't like paying taxes. They don't like having to subsidize those in the lower classes. They've already got theirs. Why should retirees be able to enjoy their golden years while receiving social security? They want the little bit of taxes that they're forced to pay to go toward police and the military so that they can feel safe on their large estates and in their mansions. While the rest of American society and its infrastructure continues to decline around us due to neglect. Why should they worry about equal justice when they can afford the best justice that money can buy? That's to their advantage. And those that can't, it's their own faults for being lazy and not being born into wealthy, privileged families that 
can afford the best education, the best lawyers, and the best of everything else. French writer Alexis de Tocqueville, after visiting America in 1831 said, I sought for the greatness of the United States in her commodious harbors, in her ample rivers, in her fertile fields and boundless forests. And it was not there. I sought for it in her rich mines, in her world commerce, her public school system, in her institutions of higher learning. And it was not there. I looked for it in her democratic Congress and her matchless constitution, nor was it there. Not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits resound with righteousness, did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Well, friends, America is ceasing to be good and becoming the oppressor both here and abroad. We are the richest country in the world and also the poorest. America's income inequality has been rising steadily for the past 50 years, and it's at its highest point since World War II. Income inequality in the U.S. is higher than in any of the other developed nations, closer to the level of Mexico and Costa Rica than to the midpoint of the 35 developed countries compared by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The rich get richer while everyone else gets poorer. And we aren't paying attention or worrying about it. As Reverend William Barber notes, our constitution states that we know these truths to be self-evident, that all persons are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our defining document says one thing, but we still see misery, inequality, and death, systematic racism, and injustice that undercuts our moral character and treats so many of our citizens in unjust and ungodly ways. As Reverend Martin Luther King said, America may well go to hell if she does not deal with the issues of child poverty, of the adult poverty, and economic and racial injustice. Well, 15 years later, we haven't and still are not dealing with these issues, but instead are idly watching them grow worse. Many Americans complain about giveaways like welfare, social security, and food stamps without realizing that more white people are on food stamps than Latinos, or African-Americans. Why, in the wealthiest nation in the world, do we even need these programs? Maybe it's because we give warfare, welfare to corporations that pay less in taxes 
on a percentage basis than the janitors and the secretaries that work for them. Walmart, one of this nation's largest employers, encourages their employees to apply for food stamps rather than paying a living wage or giving them full-time jobs and providing benefits. We are also slaves to racism, sexism, and economic fear that makes America and Americans seek safety and security in false nationalism and militarism by blaming and hating others rather than blaming the rich who are causing most of the problems in this country. We don't seem to realize that we are in bondage to racism, classism, and fear, but they are still draining us of our morality, our compassion, and our greatness. Let's try making America truly great again by regaining our moral compass, goodness, and compassion. Jesus asks us, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? And also said, as you have done unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done unto me. Is that welfare or compassion? Dr. King said there are three things that we as Americans need to address simultaneously. Racism, classism, and militarism. And you can never unhook that unholy trinity. And here we are today, 50 years later, with those three things getting worse instead of better. Reverend Barber reminds us that racism is a myth. It's a construct that helps insecure white people feel superior to colored people. It is a myth that is so powerful that it causes poor people who need each other to allow the rich and powerful to divide them with fear and othering, while mainstream congregations stand idly by and watch. The words of Amos ring down through the centuries to indict us again of our complicity and inaction. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not, not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Do we get up and work for equal justice, equal access to education, health care, and retirement benefits? Or do we turn our heads and blame the poor for their poverty, saying in this world of oppression and inequality that they are just getting what they deserve? Is that what Jesus would say? Is that what Jesus would do? Or would Jesus feed the multitudes, overturn the tables of the money changers, and call out the hypocrisy of the social and religious elites? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin and have 
neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these that you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. Grace is all about not getting what we deserve. We cannot be faithful to the little things of personal piety while ignoring the larger, weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Let us stand with our poor sisters and brothers of all races and nationalities to be freed from the bondage of systematic racism and oppression. Let us write and call our elected officials and tell them to take care of those minimum wage workers upon whom our economies and lifestyles depend. Let us be active followers of Jesus rather than passive assenters to the fact that we are saved and forgiven and that everything will be put right eventually once we reach heaven. Jesus tells us that the kingdom of God is not far off in the here and now when we do acts of justice, mercy, and kindness. We are called to do the works of God's kingdom in the here and now, and not passively sit by and wait for pie in the sky when we die, as Satan tempts us to do. So let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like a never-ending stream of faith. For faith without works is dead. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Now let us join together in the affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now we come into our time of prayer together. For those at home, please let me know how we can pray for you by emailing prayer requests to pastor at winfieldumc.org. Does anyone have joys or concerns that they would lift up this morning? Okay, let us keep John's Uncle Tom in our prayers as he has breathing problems following his treatments for lung cancer. We rejoice that Debbie has finally heard from Tanya and seems to be doing all right. That is a joy. Thank you for sharing that, Debbie. I would lift up the, the joy of Todd moving back to rehab and starting to make forward progress in his year-long recovery. Now, have you heard anything from Agnes Olive? Okay, Agnes is continuing to recover from COVID and doing better. 
and my friend Eric, who is dealing with the aftermaths of brain cancer surgery, is back home to continue his recovery there with his family. He hadn't seen his young son in over a month. Ern asked that we lift up his sister-in-law, Betty, as she will have surgery to implant a pacemaker on November 29th. Let us continue to lift up Marie as she continues growing weaker. Shirley as she is experiencing nausea and Janet who continues to be treated at St. Mary's Hospital in Chicago. Let us take these joys and concerns that we have named and those that yet remain upon our heart to the one whose grace and strength is sufficient. Lord God, we join with your prophets in looking forward to that day when all your people will have equal access to justice, housing, and the things that they need, not just to scrape by in this life, but to thrive and to share in your abundant life and living. Lord, we pray for those who hurt and those who are hurting. Those are who are in the hospital, those who are isolated in their homes, and those who have no homes. Lord, help us to reach out with your compassion and care for the weak and the vulnerable, for those who are in most need of your help and our help. Help us to see our brother Jesus in the face of all those we meet each day and to respond to those who you send into our paths. Now we join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now it's time for us to join in our giving of the offering. And we are once again supporting missionary Albert Willicor, who is a native of Liberia and has been chief medical officer at Ganta United Methodist Hospital in Ganta, Liberia for more than a decade is a distinguished surgeon and hospital administrator, and also uh, an experienced leading OBGYN in the Republic of Genoa. He serves with his spouse, Angeline, who is a nurse at the same hospital there in Ganta. I thank those who continue to mail in or text in their gifts to continue the missions and ministries of Winfield Community United Methodist Church. Now let us dedicate our gifts. Lord, we are aware that you provide for our needs as you did for Elijah. Help us be aware of the blessings that we receive and empower us to share them with the less fortunate. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, why don't we stand as we prepare to join in our closing hymn number 203, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, 
verses 1, 2, and 4. As we go forth into the world this week, may we seek to share justice and equality with all that we meet. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen.